Gentlemen, welcome to another of the Friday luncheon meetings of the Commonwealth Club of California, being held in the Gold Ballroom of the Sheraton Palace Hotel. On Friday of next week, our speaker, I believe in this same room, will be the Honorable Wallace Johnson, Mayor of Berkeley, and his topic, can urban crisis be avoided? Our speaker today, I don't think we'll even touch on that subject, but I want to tell you that I've had a, a most enjoyable few minutes sitting and conversing with him. This gentleman tells me that he reads 20 languages and he speaks eight. As a young man at the age of 16, he began writing for periodicals and newspapers. At the age of 20, he was sent to Russia as a special correspondent for a Hungarian daily. He received his bachelor's degree from the Theresianic Academy in Vienna and his doctor's degree from the University of Budapest. Mr. Eric von Kunelt Ledin speaks French, German, English, Hungarian, Russian, and Japanese. In fact, he has taught Japanese at Fordham University. He has served as Master of History at Beaumont College in England, and next went to Georgetown where he taught. In the summer of 1947, he resettled in Austria to devote himself to reading, writing, and further linguistic studies. His travels take him all over the world, practically on an annual pilgrimage. It is a real pleasure to introduce today Eric von Kunelt Ledin and his subject, Democracy Fails in Europe. Gentlemen, before even talking about the failure of democracy in Europe, we must really know and be aware of what is really democracy. Uh, democracy is, don't forget that, a political term. It's not a social term. And it answers the question, who should rule? And the answer it gives is the majority of politically equal citizens, either in person or through the representatives. Whereas liberalism rightly understood, that is, liberalism is understood in the whole wide big world with the exception of the United States, answers the question not who should rule, but how should rule be exercised. And the answer it gives is, regardless of who rules, Government must be exercised in such a way that each individual citizen enjoys the maximum of personal liberty. In other words, equality and majority rule characterizes democracy. Freedom characterizes liberalism. Now, of course, there is such a thing as a liberal democracy, but obviously liberalism could be combined with other forms of government. And a democracy can be illiberal. You can have a democracy where the 51% really and truly, brutally uh, suppress and tyrannize the 49% or the 99%, 1%. A man like Louis XIV, for instance, from our modern point of view, the man who allegedly had said, I am the state, was of course a very great liberal by modern standards. He couldn't draft anybody in his kingdom. If he wanted to wage a war, he had to rely on volunteers, and they had to be very well paid. He could not have, an, let us say, an annual general confession about the economic life of a person. Uh, if, he, uh, wanted, uh, if anybody wanted to make a general confession, uh, you went, of course, to a priest, not to the collector of internal revenue. A man like Louis XIV, for instance, could never decree that his beloved subjects could not drink Chartreuse or Benedictine or Sauterne, or Chateauneuf du Pape, or Veuve Clicquot, if he had done anything like that, in other words, started a prohibition, his beloved subjects would have quartered him alive within 48 hours. 
But all this can be done today, you see, with the democratic principles, because the idea is the people who are elected, they, are, they identify themselves uh, with the citizenry, and they say, you, that's us, and us, that's you, and you voted us in this position, and we do not stand on thin ice as the monarchs of old. Now, if you look at the back now, the development of democracy in Europe, bear in mind that democracy is a very primitive form of government. I've made studies of the Bambutis in Rwanda, Urundi, pygmies, who have a completely democratic society. And then, of course, on a sophisticated level, you see in Europe the rise of democracy in Greece, originally called isonomia, equality of law, and the first great victim and the discrediting of that Greek democracy happens through the assassination of Socrates. Socrates was forced to commit suicide. He was condemned to death, as you know. Why? Because he corrupted the youth. What did it mean? He ridiculed democracy. He quoted Homer, Ukagaton, Polykoirane, and so forth. If you don't believe me, read it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. That was the real reason you don't get it in the average school textbook. Now, you see, Looking from the, Aero, uh, from the Acropolis and looking down to the Areopag, you see very clearly the place democracy had the first time morally founded. And therefore, do not be surprised that not so much later you find I, Socrates, who has nothing to do with the famous Socrates, who implored the fate to send to Greece again a monarch to start a monarchical age. Now, for many, many, many centuries, democracy, except in very primitive areas, in the Alps, in the Tyrol, where I come from, after all, in neighboring Switzerland, in certain city-states, in certain peasant communities, democracy is absent. And just like a U-boat, like a submarine surfacing, democracy comes back again to our countries with the French Revolution in a forest of guillotines. And you see at that time, of course, enticed by pictures, by the uh, magic picture of the United Kingdom, uh, whose great propagator was Voltaire. And then, of course, thanks to the influence of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in other words, the Swiss example. And then finally, the American example in the most tragic fashion, because as you all know, the founding fathers were violently opposed to democracy. And nevertheless, the idea is, and you have unfortunately a man like Lafayette, so many people thoroughly and basically misunderstanding, not the American Revolution, there was no revolution, the American War of Independence and these ideals, and transplanting them finally to France. Because the American Republic was an aristocratic republic, inspired the aristocracy of all of Europe. They were coming en masse to the United States. You just have to go to Washington, D.C. and see there in front of the White House on Jackson Square in the center, the monument of Old Hickory, and in the four corners, the monuments of these four European noblemen who have come to this country to fight for liberty, but not for democracy. Tadeusz Kosciuszko, Baron von Steuben, the Comte de Rochambeau, the Marquis de Lafayette. Now you see, democracy comes into the European scene as a sort of very curious ideal. The idea is that original sin can be unmade. The coercive power of the state is going to vanish. We no longer are being ruled. We rule ourselves. But as, of course, you know very well indeed, on April the 15th, if you make out the income tax declaration, you are not really ruling to self. This is majority rule in the representatives, and we cannot escape. You see the curses of original sin, just as the idea of taking off your clothes, and uh, then you become innocent as in paradise. Nudism, in their form, is really an analogy to democracy. And then you get, finally, the American intervention, because unfortunately, the United States gets for amendments more and more democratized. And you have the great tragedies of 1918, 1919. In other words, a war won for democracy, ending in a defeat of liberty. And again, in 1945, 
a war won for democracy and another defeat of liberty. The result of number one is the rise of Lenin, of Hitler, of Mussolini. The result, of course, of number two finally is the overpowering strength of the Soviet Union and the emergence of Chinese communism. In other words, the enormous American deception and Lasky was very right in pointing out, and here we come now to the reason of the difficulties of democracy in Europe, that unless two premises are being met, and that is the two-party system on one side, <coughs> and on the other side, a common framework of reference, a public philosophy, where people are mere ins and outs, unless you meet these two conditions, you cannot have a stable democratic government. And Europe, of course, is ideologically utterly divided at the present moment or until recently, to be more precise, it was not so evident. This new, tremendous European, uh, European prosperity had hidden the fact that these ideological forces are still alive. They are now breaking out again. People got used to that prosperity. People are again starting to think the ideological uniformity of Europe is breaking up, and maybe so is yours. This is a momentous... Uh, a development now in our entire Western history. Because don't forget, democracy is only a frame. It's only a frame. It is not a picture. If now, for instance, let us say, for instance, 51% of any country votes a Nazi ticket or votes a communist ticket, then that country is becoming communist or Nazi democratically. I'm using here the adverb of the form situations which were strange to you in the past, and I hope they'll be spared to you in the future. Visiting a hard-hitting Catholic newspaper early in March 1948 in Rome. The name of the paper was Branca Leone. In Rome, on April the 18th, 1948, there was an election touch and go, because there was a real danger that the combined communist left socialist ticket might gain a majority. And walking into these editorial offices, I'm asking the young man and said, now do tell me, young man, none of them was above the age of 23 or 24. I said, now do tell me, for whom are you going to vote next month? And they say, we, oui, next month, of course, the Gasperi for the Democrazia Christiana. I said, Democrazia Christiana? Are you really Democrats? And the usual confusion between the democratic and the liberal principle. They say, yes, yes, sir. we are Democrats. And then I said, listen, boys, if you're Democrats, then you have to respect the verdict of the majority. So if the communists get 51%, will you say, as good Democrats, yes, amen, the nation had spoken, and we bowed to its verdict? And they said, well, of course not. Then we take our rosaries and our submachine guns, go up to the rooftops and shoot it out. <laughs> but you see here, a dilemma unknown to you, because never forget here the one thing, the fact which Plato has told us, book nine of his Republic, ukek alles politeias tyrannis katistatae eg demokratias, not from another form of government does tyranny arise, but out of democracy, because democracy gives the real frame to the demagogos, to the demagogue, to the people's leader who humbly says, oh no, I am not a ruler, I'm only leading you along, I'm personifying you, I am not a father, uh, away with the father image, I'm a man, a fellow like you and me, I'm a square, I'm a brother, big brother. You see, this is precisely the evolution, and it's for that reason that Metternich said uh, during the French Revolution, when I, Liberté, Fraternité, Egalité, you know, said Metternich, if I see how the name brother is being used now in France, I'm very much inclined to call my own brother cousin. <laughs> but here we come now to an important point, and this is the father point, the father image, which after all is deeply engraved in Europe and will remain engraved as long as there are families in Europe. As long as the fathers are king in the family, kings in the families. And if really you actually go now and look 
at the newspaper kiosk and look at these cheap weekly papers which we have in Europe, which you do not have in America. It's nothing like looking, it's nothing like time, it's nothing like life. These cheap, very cheap papers written for the broad masses, what does really interest them? And the answer is nothing but the loves and the divorces, or the pending divorces, or the menacing divorces, and the marital misunderstandings, and the pregnancies, and the births, and the funerals of the members of the defunct European monarchies. It's Faradibar, and it's Elizabeth, and it's Prince Philip, and, uh, it, and on, and on, and on the whole line down to the Near East, because of course we are already have a scarcity of that material. The father-mother image, the concept of the, fa the whole nation as a family is exceedingly strong. And do you know, some of you have read probably the San Francisco Chronicle on the, 22nd, uh, the, 20, uh, uh, the 26th of this month. And there you find uh, a report at the Bild Post in Germany and that quick two magazines conducted the Gallup poll discussing who should follow President Lübcke who made himself so ridiculous in Germany and who is now stepping down. And 40% of the readers, by far the largest block, Prince Louis Ferdinand of Prussia, the grandson of William II. There you are now. We are now 50 years away from 1918. It doesn't really change because the European is cynical. He knows that he is not really voting the people into power, that he's only really very, very microscopic whether he stays at home and actually goes to the polls, that as a person it would make no difference. But on the other side there's also growing another cognition, and one again which is not only purely European, of purely European interest, but of a general interest, and that is the fact of the ever-widening gap between the Scita and the Scienda. That means between the things, between the knowledge of the man in the street, and when I say the man in the street, I don't mean the man who is semi-literate or illiterate. No, the man who really follows the radio, who has a high school education, who has a college education. And nevertheless, what he can really know and what he ought to know the difference in order to rationally judge these events is so enormous and is getting constantly bigger and bigger, even if it were true that general education increases the educational levels in an arithmetic progression. The things which ought to be known go up in a geometric progression. What does the average American know about Vietnam? What do the protesting students know about Vietnam? Absolutely nothing. They can only make an act of faith in the best Lutheran fashion in either this or in that commentator. What does the average Englishman know, for instance, about Rhodesia? He knows nothing whatsoever. You see, David Riesman has said sex is the last frontier, and that is true in the emotional domain. But in the intellectual domain, it is religion and politics, politics and religion, where everybody can shout his mouth off, but the feeling is growing, we really know nothing about these affairs. And of course, that shakes the faith in democracy, which of course makes sense in the Tyrolean village where I live, or the Canton Glarus with 38,000 people debating whether one should give a license to a chocolate factory or not. This is within the scope of the six, 7,000 sturdy Swiss men in the marketplace in Glarus. It's a wonderful picture. But the big man in the Mars state, what does he know? And does not this more and more invite the rule by experts, the cold-blooded rule by experts? And then the question comes, who is going to control the experts? What are we going to do if the experts, as it usually happens, contradict each other? These are unsolved questions. These were questions more or less solved in the monarchies of old but they appear like a golden age way back in the background. Because the man in the street, if you ask him, does he believe in democracy? Of course he nods, he does. Does you believe in the Republican system? Most people do. But at the same time, of course, the word democracy is a complete weasel word. What we need is a democratic monarchy. Hitler had spoken about Nazism, eine deutsche Demokratie, and Mussolini, una democrazia organizzata. And yen in democratia pon novomo, a democracy in a new style. So it's everywhere, and of course, therefore, nowhere. And now comes the new, a new political, there is a little bit of the old nationalism now coming up. 
There's coming up the new left. And the new left is exceedingly interesting because in the new left, if you really study their books and works, the whole critique, what they call the establishment. I don't know how many of you gentlemen realize and how many of these writing students realize that two thirds or three quarters of their critique of the modern democratic liberal state is exactly the same critique as of the old European conservatives from the early 19th century, where they had foretold, they said, if you have a purely commercial civilization, the whole thing just won't do. It will end all in planning. It ends in rat races. It, and it ends in a dull sort of materialism. It's all the prophecies of the old conservatives, which they are using without realizing that they do. Because maybe that even their ideological leaders don't realize that. And of course, in other words, this thing, this feeling, what they call in Germany, for instance, das Unbehagen in der Demokratie, this feeling of uneasiness, of emptiness, of dullness. It has no warmth. It's a fight for numbers. Now, mind you, this does not mean that I foretell you a return to monarchy now or in the foreseeable future. All this tiredness with politicians. Oh, I would say 100 years ago, if you said ein Politiker, a politician, Oh, that was, it was a fine thing, that was a sort of an intellectual and so on. But today it gets slowly the same flavor as in the United States. And the people distinguish very carefully between politicians and statesmen. And they said, you know, Adenauer, that was not a politician. He was a statesman. And of course, as much as they dislike the Gaulle, and the Gaulle is by no means a popular man in France, but he's respected. He's respected, he's a sort of statesman. He doesn't really do very little politics. So a man like Franco, uh, also not really popular at all, but nevertheless uh, grudging admission. People who have been very long on their jobs who now really know the ropes, who have really an age-old experience, who know the people around the country, and of course, really, are going at least to some places, even in spite of failures, even in spite of the failure of the Gaulle's East European policy, even in spite, of course, of the inevitable failure of the French financial policy after the enormous damages done early here in this summer. But you do see here a real crisis. You do see the crisis of authority, which again, you see, is not a purely European problem. Because you see, authority is something else than power. Uh, the, the Russian uh, government has an enormous amount of power. But authority really means that when you get an appeal or when you get a command, that there is in you already a certain willingness to concede it, to accede to it, to collaborate, you see, to cooperate. All this, this is authority, the parental authority. There must be, in, in authority, there must be a certain amount of love and affection mixed in, and the respect, the curious mixture of all sorts of sentiments. And this authority is collapsing in Europe. And of course, when authority collapses, then finally you see then in a tremendous amount of nakedness, then finally the harsh alternatives. If it isn't authority, it is going to be sheer power. Sheer power doing what? Sheer power really based on what? See, here comes the uneasiness, because after all, the European armies, with the possible exception of the French army, because never forget that the French army in 1958, in May 1958, was absolutely ready to strike and to snuff out the Fourth Republic. And only because people went on their knees before the Gaulle, and the Gaulle sourly and unwillingly and arrogantly finally said his yes to the receivership of the bankrupt Fourth French Republic, the military dictatorship of Massu didn't follow. And this was a situation which had now been repeated in the same months, almost in about the same days, not in 58, but in 68, 
where de Gaulle had made every conceivable preparation that if there would be a further deterioration of the French internal situation, really to take over. And the situation is very complex. You see, the communists, for instance, who are old line men in the whole game of the political forms and the political experience, they are terrified by the New West. They want to use it, but they see it's a very dangerous thing to use. We had in Italy, you had an Italian communist poet who has written an ode to the Italian police battling the students. And you see, roughly this ode begins, I'm trying now to give it to you freely as I remember it. I never took down the name, unfortunately, of that poet. He says, I'm greeting you, humble sons of workers in dingy factories. I'm greeting you, the policemen, humble sons of workers, of peasants in sun-drenched fields, spat upon and vilified by the long-haired, fat sons of the bourgeoisie. In other words, you see, the new left is a youth movement, which rebels for reasons I can very well see, because after all, I'm an old line conservative, and I look at it, you see, from the other angle. But they do not think dialectically. They do not think what counterforces they bring finally on the plan. And there you see sometimes between this country here, I should say it in all candor, and in Germany in 1932, uh, I see certain analogies. And then, of course, Brüning, who was the counterplay of Hitler, whom I've met in this country here because I spent these years in your country, has said, told me how he tried to restore the monarchy to forestall the rise of a man like Hitler. And of course, Hindenburg said, no, I've given the oath to the Constitution. I'm a monarchist. I despise the Republic, but I can't do it. My, I'm bound. And then, of course, Schleicher, General Schleicher, who wanted to get the aid of the German trade unions to have a military dictatorship supported by the trade unions in order to forestall the rise of the Nazis. In other words, taking his cue from Miguel Primo de Rivera, the Spanish dictator, and the trade unions did not cooperate. What will we get? Will we get military dictatorships? Because you see, what Europe is now a country, and always has been a continent in the last 50 years, a continent of the provisional. And let me go only one moment back to France, how provisional Europe is, how the order really doesn't stick is very well symbolized by a poster of the Soudé Paint Manufacturing Company, which you could see in the French subways in the early 1950s. It showed four Mariannes. Marianne, as you know, is the symbol of the French Republic, a nice, healthy young woman with the Phrygian cap, and a fifth little Marianne looking around the corner. And the text said, the republics come and go, but the Soudé paints stay forever. And that, I think, highlights the European scene far, far better than some very big and fat books. The things are all rootless. The things are all hanging in question. There's a question mark around practically everything in Europe, but it needs a certain perspicacity and a certain let us say, fingertip feeling to discover really just that. But you see here military dictatorship, return of monarchies. Of course, there's the Russian dividing line, which makes everything provisional, doubly provisional in one sense, and irreplaceable on the other because you don't want to change really horses in midstream. And Europe is permanently, so to say, in midstream. What will happen is very difficult to know. You only see the Hippocratic traits on the faces of European democracy. And for a last thought, let us go back again to the Acropolis. Well, the Acropolis is, in a way, the cradle of our entire Western civilization. And there you see the Areopark. And I mentioned to you Socrates, the condemnation of Socrates. And then you see the Syntagma place. And behind the Syntagma place, you see the royal palace. Where democracy was born, there was a king only until, well, until a few months really ago. And then there you have a military dictatorship. And you see what Polybius called the anacyclosis, 
They're going around in great circles. They do not have to repeat themselves with photographic accuracy, but they do. And therefore, in the case of Europe, as in the case of the rest of the world, one must be deeply and profoundly conscious of these ever-going changes and ever-going challenges and never think that if you have achieved a certain form of government, that then history really comes to an end and the pendulum ceases to swing. It goes on and on swinging. Thank you so much. Dr. Ledeen, will you return with me to the rostrum, please? We have a number of questions, some of which I'm sure you have touched upon, but I'm going to ask them and give you a chance to enlarge on it, if I may. First question, why should we expect the democracy of our founding fathers to fit the modern world atomic age? Well, there ain't no such animal. There was no democracy of the founding fathers. Their picture was radically different, and I think in many ways more modern than the concepts here today. Because I do not think, as I tried to express to you, that by counting noses, you really can come to rational conclusions. That in other words, more democracy is more amateurism. And this is something we cannot afford. But on the other hand, in the same breath, I must always add, that I am terrified also by the prospect of, uh, of experts in an administrative state uh, ruling and administrating us in very cold blood. So in other words, there is really a Scylla and Charybdis. But the Founding Fathers, curiously enough, were not as old-fashioned as we r sometimes too readily assume. What is happening to humankind, this questioner asks. The free seemingly want to enslave themselves. The enslaved are struggling for freedom. Yeah, you see, man is a dialectic creature. And if you speak about the leftist movements west of the Iron Curtain, it's quite true. You see east of the Iron Curtain, the desperate desire for freedom. As a matter of fact, in all likelihood, I think many more people are reading voluntarily with interest Karl Marx west of the Iron Curtain than east. In my whole summer in 1963, which I spent in the Soviet Union, I encountered, and I've spoken with innumerable people, I have only encountered three truly convinced male communists. And I'm quite sure that if I would visit now, let us say, the campus of the University of Frankfurt, I don't want to go too near to your home, then, of course, uh, and don't forget, and these students of the University of Frankfurt who demonstrated were physically attacked by workers' wives who hit them with their umbrellas and said, you swine, you go home and study, because you studied our expense anyhow. You see here the dialectical nature of man and the need to think here really dialectically, also not in a Marxian Hegelian sense. I think you touched upon this uh, question too, uh, Doctor, but it reads, has any country in the world ever really been a democracy? A direct democracy you really had in, this, in, in a number of Swiss cantons. Of course, they have no female suffrage. You see, that is because a woman doesn't bear arms in Switzerland and you are only fully a citizen in the Swiss mind if you bear arms. Don't forget, this is the country where you serve your country every year until you're 42 years old. You can volunteer until 55, and where in every public office is the picture of the commanding general, never ever of a president. In other words, Switzerland, which is the model democracy, is a military democracy. No. But it is, it is, if you forget now the lack of it, it is a very, very genuine democracy. That's, that's really the case. 
And so have been other smaller countries. But as soon as the country is really very large, there are too many sieves. And of course, the founding fathers never envisaged a democracy. The word democracy neither appears in the Declaration of Independence nor in the Constitution. The word republic appears neither in the Declaration of Independence nor in the Constitution of the United States, only as an adjective. Member states must have a republican constitution. The United States is not called a republic. Even a man like Jefferson still thought about the possibility, and this is a language strange to the man in the street, that a free people, a free people, can be ruled by a monarch. And the phrase, I hope you read the fine print in the Declaration, and not only the preamble. George III, a prince not fit to be the ruler of a free people. Because we always are going to be ruled. We never can really rule ourselves. That's a paradise dream. And all our effort should be to be as free as possible and feel the heavy hand of government as little as possible. There were several questions uh, submitted that followed this same type of wording, Doctor. Is democracy going to fail in the United States? And if so, why? I'm giving to you to this a philosophic answer. An unnamed Viennese uh, philosopher once said, everything in the Viennese dialect it sounds nicer. Everything has an end, only the sausage has two. And there has never been a form of government which in history lasted forever. But the only burning question is, and think about Germany in 32, will there be something better to follow or something worse? And therefore, you see, these needs thinking or rethinking. What would happen to this country if in the next eight years Four or eight years, law and order will not be restored. What are then the aspects or prospects? You know, everything is, sometimes the evolutions take, are very slow. Think about the Medicis, drugstore people from Florence. 350 years it took them to become Grand Dukes of Tuscany. They had the patience. You see, everything changes. Everything changes. A Christian verb says, the world whirls around and only the cross stands. Never attach yourselves to values which one day will perish or must be adapted or must be radically changed. Will it be a military dictatorship? A military dictatorship of all forms of dictatorship is still the mildest form. Look at the liberalization of present-day Spain. But we must, you see, all these things must be viewed and thought with a certain amount of secular impiety. You see? Secular impiety. But think about the basic ideals. And the basic ideal is not the majority ideal. It's, of course, not the equality ideal. The basic ideal is personal freedom. And the question is, if it comes to the worst, what form of government under what form of government is there a good chance that freedom, personal human freedom, free enterprise, the idea of liberty, will really be preserved? And very often, as the Italian case, I told you about the Italian elections, it may be not the idea that you just count votes. Dr. Ledeen, I know that in your talk you referred to the question of authority versus power. I also know from what you told me that you have lectured at San Francisco State. Do you think that the problem that we're facing <coughs> there today and the militancy shown by those students uh, involves the question of authority versus power? Yeah, I, I don't know exactly how you refer to, but in a chaos, if chaos is anywhere, and if authority fails, Power inevitably will come into play. This may be either the power of the many, the power of the mobs, because also that is power, don't forget that, or the power of those uh, whose legal 
and constitutional task it is to restore law and order. Then, of course, uh, the, uh, the appeal to authority, if authority has been destroyed, and authority has been destroyed in many parts of the world, power is the only answer. But, of course, for heaven's sakes, I would say power which is intelligently and generously, very important word, and generously used. This questioner asks, some representatives to the European Economic Community express that there is a need for political integration as well as economic integration. Will you please comment both pro and con? I, I would say certainly that uh, we have to integrate economically, that we also have to integrate politically, but of course we should be careful in the latter because the genius of Europe, every continent or every country has its own genius, is diversity. In other words, that this integration of Europe, I think the de Gaulle's formula doesn't necessarily mean de Gaulle's ideas. Une Europe des patries, that means a Europe of fatherlands, but coordinated, that should be very, very definitely our ideal. And of course, obviously, in close cooperation with the other free countries of the world, and that means primarily, of course, the United States. Because the Atlantic Ocean really is a binding piece of water. Is the university student unrest in Florence and Paris communistic inspired in your opinion? I don't think so in its really in its origins. Of course, wherever there is disorder and anarchy, the communists will try to utilize this to their own ends. But it is equally true that the French Communist Party was really desperate and from that old to the policeman by a communist writer, you can see very well indeed how the communist partly is unhappy about it. Because actually, you know, the student riots and the student fer uh, uh, fer ferment is one of an anarchical character, not of a communistic character. And the anarchists, you must leave it to the anarchists, were that group in the old Soviet Union who fought on against communism long after all the other parties had given up. Because there's the curious thing. You see, the anarchist stands for total liberty and the communist for total control. And finally, in 1924, immediately after the death of Lenin, all anarchists in all Russian prisons were all rubbed out. So you see, the anarchists are a very uneasy partner for communism. Do the political coalitions in Western Europe tend to provide more democratic rule than America's two-party system? I don't think so, and primarily for the reason, because if you have three parties, for instance, and the third party is very small and sits in the center, I'm thinking here especially of the old German Center Party. Then you can get a minority tyranny because that party is going to align itself in one uh, vote taking with the right and the other vote taking with the left and can play out one party against another. That's the reason, Lasky said, the two-party system gives you the optimum. But the two-party system is not something you can decree. The two-party system is something which comes naturally and it came in America in the past very naturally because you had an enormous political uniformity in this country. So that, let us say, a liberal Republican and a liberal Democrat had more in common than a conservative Democrat and a conservative, a conservative Republican. In other words, it cut across state lines. If you took, for instance, a subway in New York, and you took out, let us say, 6 p.m., all the 10,000 human sardines, every one of them, if asked, would believe in the republic as the best and most modern form of government. And 999 out of 1,000, except the one who read the Founding Fathers, 
would have believed that democracy is the most ideal procedure. You do the same thing today in Spain. You stop the Madrid or the Barcelona subways, they are broad gauge, they have many more human sardines than the New York subway. And of course, the one would be a liberal Democrat, the next one is a Trotskyite uh, uh, communist, the third one an anarchist, the fourth one a liberal monarchist, the fifth one a traditionalist monarchist, the sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can give you all the 28 different groups. And when I once talked to a Spanish lawyer and said, my dear friend, you had 28 different parties at the last free election, the man pounded the table and said, this is a dirty lie, because we have 28 million different parties. <laughs> as many parties as there are Spaniards. But this is not conducive, and do not forget that brilliant passage in George Washington's farewell address, which was ghostwritten by Alexander Hamilton, when he said, the party spirit, the factional spirit, they can afford it in the monarchies of Europe, but we can't afford it here. But you are in a situation now where such possibilities, the first time in your history, are really very concretely on the horizon. Dr. Eric von Knelt Ledeen, I want to thank you for being our speaker today, and I'm sure the members present at this meeting share my feeling on behalf of the Commonwealth Club of California and those other members who will have the opportunity to hear you on radio. I thank you. Uh, I might tell you, gentlemen, that this uh, Mr. Ledeen, we invited him one year ago to appear today. I think maybe we better sign him up again right now for a year from today. <laughs> the meeting is adjourned. This is William L. Hudson. Across the microphone from me sits Dr. Eric von Knelt Ledeen, noted journalist and lecturer, author of the weekly European letter and William Buckley's National Review, who spoke before the weekly general meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California here at the Sheraton Palace Hotel in San Francisco on the topic, Democracy Fails in Europe. Perhaps we ought to define ourselves a little bit first, uh, Dr. Uh, von Knelt Ledeen. Uh, what is democracy? Democracy is, first of all, we must bear in mind, a purely political term. And it answers the question, who should rule? And the answer it gives is the majority of politically equal citizens, either in person or for the representatives. That means in democracy there are only two principles involved. The one is majority rule, and the other one political equality. Whereas liberalism, rightly understood, is the way it is understood outside of the United States at least, uh, does not answer the question who should rule, but how should rule be exercised? And the answer it gives is, regardless of who rules, government must be exercised in such a way that each individual citizen enjoys the greatest amount of personal liberty. In other words, you can have a tyrannical democracy yes. and you can have a liberal Dictatorship, for instance, yeah. yes, or, or absolute monarchy, a liberal absolute monarchy, you know. Well, then, uh, Dr. von Knelt Ledeen, uh, you said in your talk to the Commonwealth Club that democracy is a very primitive form of government. Why do you make that kind of a statement? Well, uh, it is uh, in, in history, if you speak to ethnologists, they will point out to you that the most primitive form of government is democracy. That means majority decides. This majority must not necessarily be carefully numerically expressed, but if the majority of a tribe, let us say of primitive collectors on the beach, want to go right, then of course those who wanted to go in the left direction are really virtually forced to follow them. And my friend of mine, Führer Heimendorf, who has made very interesting investigations in the Chengtu tribe, aboriginals in central India, then you take the research of Gunnar Landmann, then the few investigations I did with the um, Bambuti in Rwanda, Urundi region, they all confirmed this very, very primitive form because the chieftain, who is stronger than the others and wiser, and let us say is even able to impose his own son, that already is a further development, that already is a higher development. <laughs>
Well, then, uh, Dr. Von Knut Ledeen, what uh, is the history of democracy? When did d democracy first develop? You, would you say that it was one of the first ways of government we ever had? Uh, yes, if you call it government, because at that very primitive state, state and society are still entirely identical. And then, of course, you have it in a sophisticated form, at first called isonomia, in ancient Attica, that means uh, the polis state of Athens. Mm -hmm. And this goes uh, until really end, even after the death of Socrates, who was condemned to death, as you can read it, very nicely explained in the Encyclopedia Britannica, he was primarily condemned to death because he ridiculed democracy. Now, uh, nowadays we have what are called the people's democracies, at least they call themselves that. Are they democracies? Well, um, certainly not in the way I have defined the term, mm -hmm. because they are really oligarchic, that means small groups, the communist parties, yeah. are the so-called. And you see here already the ignorance, because democracy means people rule. And then if you speak about uh, people's democracy, then you should have one more form, the popular people's democracy. Then you have the word people three times. And that signifies that the people really have nothing at all to say. What led to the re-establishment of democracy in Europe? The re-establishment of democracy in Europe is first of all the French Revolution. Uh, the French Revolution being inspired <clears throat> a little bit by England, or more so by Switzerland, and uh, also by the United States, but at the same time, you see I've published a book on America's founding fathers and know their views of democracy. This was an enormous misunderstanding, one of the many, many misunderstandings between Europe and the United States. Men like uh, Lafayette, for instance, uh, who had come back and, of course, became an ardent Democrat. And there you had a lovely scene in, uh, in Paris at the dinner when Gouverneur Morris, who was the American minister to Paris, he got in a heated argument with Lafayette and he finally pounded the table. And he said, I am against your democracy, Monsieur de Lafayette, out of respect for liberty. And then you see, I mean, since I mentioned Gouverneur Morris, yes. you know, in 1815, he delivered on his estate a very famous speech. And the speech started with the following words. The Bourbons are back on their thrones. Europe is free again. And to the average American, of course, the Bourbon would be a symbol of oppression, except uh, if he takes it in his liquid form. Well, then, uh, what is the situation today in Europe? Now, today in Europe you see uh, uh, democracy in, not in an obvious way, but in a subtle way, in a profound uh, crisis. The contributing factors to this crisis are that uh, Europeans are getting used to their tremendous prosperity. They're starting to think, to reflect. Uh, they find democracy totally uninspiring. You constantly get the outcry in Western Europe, in the German form would be, Europa braucht eine Idee. Europe needs an idea, an inspiring idea. Because you see, democracy is, and this is what people usually forget, a mere frame. It is not a picture. And you could, in a less, let us say, communists win an election with 51%, and of course, obviously, then a country becomes communistic democratically. You see, I'm using here mm -hmm. the adverbial form. And so, of course, uh, being disgusted and tired of their pol politicians who run their countries, they are, in a way, atavistically remembering the days. The nations formed big families with monarchical heads, and you get this fantastic thing which you probably read in the newspaper, that the Bild Post in Germany and the Quick a Weekly Review, they made a Gallup poll looking for a man popular in Germany as a successor to President Lübcke. And the people chose Prince Louis Ferdinand of Prussia, uh, who is a fairly well-known composer, he's a very musical man, he's a, batch, uh, he's a widower, and a man who has worked in Detroit at Forts as a young man, in other words, uh, very still good-looking man in his early 60s. So you see, back to the Hohenzollerns. <laughs> do, do, do the masses know enough to rule? No, for the, the masses themselves never rule and rule nowhere, if you speak really about the masses except in the small cantonal state. They elect people, but the question is, are these people they elect really very superior to them? 
And what is the image the European has about the politician? I remember having once an argument with a French taxi driver. I gave him too little a tip, and then the invectives came back and forth. And he finally called me espèce d'un député. Well, creature of a representative, you know. I mean, uh, mm. denoting the worst form of prostitution imaginable. Well, in this day when we uh, have to know more and actually know less, does anybody know enough to rule? No, the, the problem is to get really people who know so much, they, they can rationally coordinate uh, between experts. So that would be, of course, you must understand me. I think there is no good government without consulting the people. There's no good government which doesn't know what the people really want. The question is only whether they should have it, you know. This, is a, this makes a difference. But now, if you coordinate expert views, now let us say a man is gravely ill, and his general practitioner who treats him is the end of his wits, and they invite some four or five first-rate expert. The general practitioner has really studied medicine. And therefore, he can, and he knows the patient very well, too, of course. And he can make a really rational effort to coordinate even the conflicting views, eliminate some, choose others, among these experts. In other words, he can sit in council with them. But the loving wife of the patient who dearly loves her husband and in a way knows him best, but she's not medically uh, prepared, and therefore, her sitting in council with these experts is makes no sense. It's mm. irrational. In other words, there's a place for experts, but not as the rulers. There is a place for experts, for coordinators, but I certainly would not give them the free reign either. Uh, now, how about the new left? Uh, what are their criticisms of democracy? Well, they, uh, they have discovered what uh, everybody knows anyhow, and that is that uh, the formula, we rule, we elect our leaders, we elect our presidents, means existentially absolutely nothing. Because uh, if you, uh, whether you go and vote or don't vote, this is a mere lottery. I mean, if you have voted, you don't know whether you vote, uh, your, your vote uh, means a defeat or whether it means a victory. The next day you open the newspapers, you start at the last page, you look at the stock exchange, you look at the state lottery as we have them in Europe, and you look maybe at the comics. Finally, if you really come to page one, then you discover whether you won or lost. And that the grandiose phrase, we elect, we determine. What does it mean, we? The majority does. And whether you are the majority or not is another question. And then you have an additional problem in Europe. Because we have many parties. Now, after the election, they enter coalition. And you can imagine the man who was so happy to see that his party was, let us say, a very large party, but has no absolute majority, that finally they enter a coalition with a party they loathe from the bottom of their heart. And he can't prevent it. He has to wait another four years to refuse to give his tiny little vote to that party. See, a cynical spirit, an impious spirit, the cynical spirit would see right through. Because obviously you can believe me that if through my vote could determine the fate of the Austrian Republic, I would vote each time with the greatest enthusiasm. But since I can't do it. Would you say that the safeguard of, uh, continuing that thought, would you say the safeguard of the United States has been that the two main parties have not differed too much? Yes, precisely. This is. Uh, this is the thing in, on which Washington, uh, and let us say uh, Alexander Hamilton, who wrote his farewell address, they insisted, they said, well, in a monarchy where you have a monarch and where you have an army sworn into the monarch, you can afford having a strong and great variety of views. But in a democratic republic like ours, the party spirit, that means the ideological division would be fatal. And I'm afraid now there are certain signs that this, this ideological uniformity uh, is slowly breaking up, and from all sorts of sides. The new left, and of course another third party, maybe in your think, and uh, there you are. What, uh, Dr. von Kunelt Ledeen, what would you say is the real crisis today? Is it the crisis of authority or crisis of power? Well, of course, I would say uh, primarily you have a real crisis of authority uh, 
which permeates uh, all of Western civilization. And authority means a foothold of uh, an outside power in your heart and mind. Not only mind, in the heart too. A king had authority because uh, he was considered to be, he was anointed and he was crowned and he was beloved. He was the pater patrie. In World War I, difficult for an American to believe it, many Austrians died really with the name of Francis Joseph on their lips. In other words, he really had authority, even if you criticize his decisions very often. But this was a family affair. He was dead. He was the pater patrie. And uh, I just remember here when Teddy Roosevelt visited Francis Joseph, no longer president of the United States, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt.